Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, Phoenix Mayor Greg Stanton joins us to discuss the city's new transit plan. Also tonight, we'll look at efforts to improve college graduation rates for Latinos. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Phoenix Mayor Greg Stanton joins us each month to discuss issues of importance to the state's largest city, including a 32 billion 35 year transportation plan. Here now is Phoenix Mayor Greg Stanton. Good to see you again. Great to be back. Uh, before we get to the transportation plan, a little tease there. Uh, last time you were here, we talked about the city manager's ideas for a budget. Now we have the city manager's budget. Um, balanced again now, but for the next five years, not so balanced. Talk to us. Yeah, so uh, over the last few years, we've always had, unfortunately, deficits in our budget that always had to be managed appropriately, and we did manage them uh, appropriately, always ended up with a, uh, a balanced budget. City of Phoenix, a very, very fiscally well-managed city. This year, because we rolled up our sleeves over the last couple of years and made some tough choices, we do have a balanced budget. This year, we're going to be hiring more police officers this year. Our police officer hiring plan is in full swing now, so we have 10 officers in the academy now and 25 every quarter for the next three years. And so we're going to get over 3,000 officers uh, for the city as a whole. So very positive thing for the city. Obviously, we've got more work to do. So in future years, we do a projected deficit, just like we originally had a projected deficit this year. So we're going to have to roll up our sleeves and make sure that we are doing everything we possibly can to uh, think about this in advance so that we can be in a better position of a balanced budget next year. Uh, police and fire pensions up $37 million. Should the city delay those payments or phase in those payments. Yeah, so what may, people watching the show may have read about recently was the result of some litigation. The state legislature did pass a law that reduced cost of living increases for people receiving their pension. There was a lawsuit among those the recipients of the pension and they won. The state lost and therefore the city's lost. And so we got some new numbers on what we had to pay in order to make up for the passed uh, mm -hmm. lesser amount of uh, uh, payments, and it was a huge amount. It would have been this year alone well over $30 million. Uh, so by spreading that out actually over a 22-year period, we won't have to take over $30 million in cuts this year. That simply would have been unfair to the people of Phoenix that in such short notice, finding out about the result of this litigation in November of this year, to have to take a 30 plus million dollar hit on our budget uh, this year. So the city manager is recommending, and I certainly support a very wise decision, which is to spread it out much like you would a mortgage, so you don't have to pay it all in one year. That is the best way to protect police officers, firefighters, the core city services of the city of Phoenix. Or because this would be about 70 some odd million once you know terms are due here. Or you could raise taxes, fees, cut comps, just like we did, saw you do previously. Uh, was that, is that still an option? Yeah, for this year, that is not a realistic option. For, for this year to take the full uh, lump sum, if you will, yes. of the cost of litigation would be almost $40 million in a uh, single year. There is no reasonable way that we could do that without m making significant cuts. And again, our core city services public safety, parks, uh, library, senior center, youth centers. There's no reasonable way to do that. This is a very well-managed city. Moody's has consistently said that Phoenix um, has one of the best cities to manage through the recessionary period. We have the highest credit rating of any large city in the United States uh, of America. Continuing in that smart fiscally, fiscal management type system, uh, the city manager has made this recommendation, and I do believe it's the right recommendation. Uh, how smart can you be, though, when these pensions continue to increase? I mean, at some point, rubber's going to hit road, is it not? Well, it certainly is going to hit road, and that's why I, as Mayor of Phoenix, have called upon the governor and the legislature to act quickly on public safety pensions. What people watching this show at home need to know is that the civilian employee pension, the one that we manage, is doing very, very well. We have passed significant pension reform. We've eliminated pension spiking. So you don't see those numbers going up for the civilian pension uh, as a percentage of our budget in the next few years is actually gonna start to shrink. The public safety pension for police officers and firefighters is increasing exponentially. So I, I'll, on this television show, I will once again call upon the governor and legislature take the offer that is being made by the leadership of 
police officers and firefighters across the state accept that offer to get to the negotiating table and engage in pension reform so that you too can get the savings that we are receiving and then we can also receive those savings. So it's two different pension systems. Civilian pension is doing much better. The public safety pension needs a lot of help but needs to be done at the state level. That civilian pension, is there another question on the August ballot regarding pension? Yes, so, so we have authorized uh, city management and put on the ballot. We'll be voting on it to make it official literally this, uh, this week. But yes, there'll be some additional pension reform uh, at the city of Phoenix. Look, when we passed pension reform in 2013, the voters of the city of Phoenix overwhelmingly said, we've got to get this better under control. We've got to ask new employees to pay a significantly higher amount in order to receive uh, a pension. It's not, we're not trying to be too difficult on those employees, but it's simply math. The math has to work. If you're going to offer a pension, they had to pay uh, more to receive it. Under this pension reform, um, instead of paying 15 or 16 percent of their compensation in order to receive a pension, we'll lock in at 11 percent, but they'll be reduced benefits at the end of the day as well. Again, so the mathematics will work uh, as well. We're also going to cap the amount that someone can receive for a pension only up to $125,000 of your salary. Above that, you're not gonna be in the pension system uh, anymore. So you're no longer gonna see uh, uh, payouts like you saw for our former city manager, which that's not really what the system is there for. The system is there to ensure that our rank and file employees have retirement security. Everybody wants to ensure that people have a reasonable, decent retirement security so people can live in dignity uh, during their later years. It's not supposed to be so that people can get wealthy off of it. This pension reform will also fix that problem. Last qu uh, point, very quickly on this, uh, the idea of delaying phasing in those payments. You like it, the city manager likes it, does the council like it? Do you expect a fight out of this? Well, I. I like everything in our city council, we're going to have probably a healthy disagreement, a good debate. That's good for democracy. Both sides should get a full airing and the full uh, airing of their uh, of their views. But realistically, um, a almost $40 million hit to our budget in a single year would cause uh, pro uh, difficulties in, in people's daily lives in terms of, again, those parks, libraries, senior center, youth centers, even public safety. That's too much of a hit in one year. That would not be smart fiscal management to take it all in one year. To phase it in over the time period that the city manager suggests, to give us time to plan to deal with it, is a much smarter way of dealing with that particular issue. Let's get to the transportation plan. Again, $32 billion over 35 years. Are the numbers solid? Because I'm seeing 50% for buses, 33% for uh, street improvement, and 17% percent for light rail. Critics are saying those are nice promises. Similar things were promised in 2000, never happened. Well, first off, we did pass Transit 2000 overwhelmingly in the city of Phoenix in 2000. And you know what? I, it's been a great thing for the city of Phoenix to have buses on Sundays, buses that go later in the evening, light rail, $7 billion of economic activity along the light rail line. Light rail has gone significantly above uh, projections. So much of the excitement that is happening in our heart of our city and throughout the city simply wouldn't be happening if we didn't have a great uh, light rail system. We, I believe as mayor, and I know the people of the city of Phoenix understand, you can't be a great city unless you offer great transportation options to the people of Phoenix. And that's what this plan will do. But, but you got, when you offer the options, you gotta make sure that the numbers are solid. And again, I'm seeing 50 and 17 and uh, 33. Sure. 17 for light rail, the critics are already saying, hey, no way it's gonna be 17. Can you say that this is exactly what the people are gonna get? The critics were there in 2000 saying that people wouldn't lie to a right rail. And I respect the critics. I respect their viewpoint. We should have a healthy debate over a critically important issue like transportation. But the critics were wrong in 2000. Light rail has been overwhelmingly popular and overwhelmingly successful in the city of Phoenix. Could you imagine going back to pre-2000? We didn't even have bus service on Sunday. We didn't have bus service uh, late into uh, the evenings. The mobility, people with disabilities, the mobility help that transportation gives them. It's just, you can't even, you can't measure it. This plan will triple the amount of light rails. It's gonna get light rail into South Phoenix, uh, over along I-10 to the west, up to Grand Canyon University, ASU West, up to Metro Center, up to uh, Northeast Phoenix and uh, uh, Paradise Valley Mall. Significant improvements in bus service. 
significant improvements in dial rod and it has a tremendous amount of money for street improvements. We have been cut by the state legislature in what's called the HERF money, Highway User Fund money, and you know what? I'm not going to wait for the legislature anymore. We've got to improve our streets. We've got to get them up to the appropriate standards for commerce, and this plan will allow us to do that. So if you want to wait around for the federal government or the state government to give you money, I'll let someone else do that. In Phoenix, we're going to take by the bull by the horns. We're going to lead, and we're going to advance our city through transportation. So I guess those numbers are kind of solid. Sort of solid. Well, oh, in terms of, look, what happened? Are they uh, gelatinous? <laughs> look, uh, we, we have a very solid history of fiscal management and fiscal responsibility. Those are the best numbers that, uh, okay. that we have. And by the way, if we're able to get some federal money, because this, this plan is not dependent on a significant amount of federal money, if more federal dollars come in like it has in the past, we can actually do more than what the plan is calling for. But we're trying to be as honest as we can with people, and we don't want to overpromise. certainly. For those who say, if light rail is so fantastic and you wax poetic on it, you just did a few minutes ago here, <laughs> uh, if it's so great, let developers pay for it. Why, why are we paying for this? Look, I will wax poetic uh, even more. We need, a, we need a broad range of transportation options. So not only does this plan have great light rail improvements, great bus improvements, Increased dial a ride for those who happen to have disabilities and want that mobility help. The unemployment rate among people with disability is unacceptably high around the country and in this community. Dial a ride improvements will significantly add to employment options for our disability community. Uh, street improvements, uh, uh, bike lanes, a thousand miles of bike lanes, including dedicated bike lanes within uh, the city. This is a multimodal. Uh, plan. It's not over-reliant of one type of transportation or others. It is a comprehensive plan, and it's exactly what's going to move our city forward. All right, so the developers, in other words, probably wouldn't pay for it. Is that, 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 that uh, the gist of that? Cause if, and this well, just like uh, arguably you could say then uh, uh, freeway should be paid for by landowners that are, that's not, that's not real. We owe, we owe it to the people of the city of Phoenix to provide as many transportation options as possible. And yes, there will be significant development along the light rail. Jobs are going to be created along the light rail. That's good for everyone in this economy. All right, we got to stop you right there, Mayor. Darn good to it. see you again. I want to keep waxing you, I, poetic. I, I'm sure you do. <laughs> good to see you. Thank you so much. Tonight's edition of Arizona Education looks at how, for many Latino college students in our state, the dream of graduating is just that, a dream. Producer Shauna Fisher and photographer Kyle Mounds tell us about a nonprofit called College Success Arizona that looks to improve college graduation rates for Latinos. Brenda Mendez is a perfect example of what hard work and perseverance can achieve. But she'll be the first to tell you that her success did not come easily. Been tough. Financially, it's been tough not having someone to look up to, being the first to do, go to college, being the first to start your own business, being the first in a lot of things, and also the youngest as well. Despite graduating high school with straight A's and a full ride scholarship to ASU, Brenda knew she needed some extra help. She got that from College Success Arizona. A lot of people don't realize that just because you have funding for school, doesn't mean you're going to graduate. Rich Nickel is College Success Arizona's CEO. His foundation provides financial scholarships and mentoring. Brenda's mentor was Myrna Cardenas. Not only did Myrna provide support, she was also a terrific sounding board when Brenda decided to graduate college a year early. The most important um, component of the scholarship was the mentorship. And that is where I saw a lot of my friends dropping out because they did have the financial support there, but they didn't have the mentorship component. College Success Arizona's mentors handle about 100 students apiece. They help their mentees find resources on campus, create an educational plan, and prepare to find jobs. Nichols says creating opportunities for Latino students like Brenda is crucial for Arizona. Unfortunately, the attainment rate for the Latino population here uh, is only about 17 percent. So uh, in 30 years, uh, we're going to have a demographic that is going to be the majority here. They're going to be asked to run this state and to lead us and to make our economy better. And if they're underrepresented, undereducated right now, um, that really leads to us down a path we probably don't want to go. Uh, so we have to focus on expanding Latino higher education 
cutting that attainment gap uh, between Latinos and their peers. Nickel adds, raising the Latino graduation rate will also put Arizona into the spotlight with businesses. You take the kind of regional picture, look at states like Colorado and Washington, Oregon, um, their attainment rates are higher and their poverty levels are lower. And um, you can draw really straight lines between those two. Brenda graduated in 2014 with a degree in accounting. She was recruited by the number one accounting firm in the world, but she took a risk and joined her boyfriend to run their highly successful internet company. Brenda says it's all been worth it because of a single moment. The best day for me would be walking across stage at my Arizona State University graduation and getting that diploma in my hand and walking down stage and looking at my mother and seeing her face. <laughs> and seeing her face and seeing her smile and being able to repay all the sacrifices she did. Going to college also means more income for graduates. Studies show that skipping a degree can cost half a million dollars in wages over a lifetime. Here now to discuss Latino college success is Dr. Delia Sines, an ASU pro associate professor of psychology, David Adame, chief economic development officer, president and CEO of Chicanos por la Causa, and Maria Harper Marinick, executive vice president, chancellor, and provost for the Maricopa County Community College District. Good to have you all here. Thanks for joining Thank us. You. Thank you. Uh, college success, Arizona. Uh, give me a better definition of what we're talking about here. I think what we're talking about is really fulfilling the potential of many of our young people that are coming up through the pipeline. And it means really capitalizing on their motivation to succeed, on the talents that they have, and finding ways to facilitate their success to degree, to graduation, and then to a successful trajectory in the workforce. I saw a quote, lack of success not due to ethnicity or ideology. What does that mean? No, absolutely. It means that <clears throat> we all have the opportunity of given to have a good education. And I think what we've seen at, at Chicanos Pula Causa is, is if we provide the, the resources and the tools that like anybody would need, right? A fair playing field. You know, I was talking to the University of Arizona on a, the healthcare field. A lot of times the, the children that go through the process don't get access to internships or exposures to clinics and things that would make them a better candidate to be that. It's, it's beyond just the educational part. We, we have kids that can compete with anybody in the world. It's a matter of giving them the resources and the tool and the access to different experiences. Compare improving access to improving graduation rates. Well, I think they go hand in hand, obviously. We can't uh, ignore the fact that college has uh, become more costly for students. So while we worry about graduation rates and more students completing a college degree, as you said, much needed for a good paying job, we can't ignore what's going on with access to our public education uh, institutions. So uh, we need affordability, we need to have the levels of support that David mentioned, and at the same time, as Delia said, uh, provide all of the support services and all of the pathways to help those students who are coming to college, so they have some motivation already, stay in college, complete their courses, complete their degrees, and then get on the path for successful employment. The, the largest college uh, completion gap seems to be between Latinos and white students. Is it because of access? What's, what's the reasoning here? It's a very complex question. What we do, what we have seen, for example, at ASU is that when we look at first year retention, which is a significant marker of potential success to graduation, Latino students actually do as well, if not better, than the overall population. However, it's still an additional three to four years, and if we go on the six-year trajectory, mm -hmm. it's five years to the point of graduation. And during that time, tuition costs go up, there are um, needs to create partnerships with community agencies as well as potential employers. And that's, I think, where exit points appear for Latino students, particularly um, around finances. Interesting. So it's not a matter of talent, it's not a matter of motivation, it's really a matter of creating a system that supports that facilitated success. And there seems, it, it seems as well, like I, I've read about this, a lack of, of experiences and, and resources, lack of information. A lot of these kids are the first in their families Absolutely. to go to college. Absolutely, yeah. I'm, I'm a perfect example. I, I grew up in, in central Phoenix, just in the shadows of the buildings. 
uh, our house was bought up with some development that was going on. I moved into the Paradise Valley School District just because my dad worked for the Basha family and that's where he was at. So I got to go to a school that was primarily white. I was one of a handful of, of people of color at this school. And it wasn't when I finally made friends and went to the dinner table and met their parents, it wasn't they were discussing whether their children were going to go to college, it was which college. Yeah. And for me, it was none of my family had ever gone there, so they were able to give me some guidance and those types of things. So that's why we need to have a, when we work in the continuum, from birth to when it's time to go to college, we have to give different programs such as training parents to understand how to navigate system. School choice is a big thing. Personally, I've changed my, my, my three daughters, young daughters, three times. I went from public to charter to private Christian schools to make sure that I finally got into the school that I knew was going to provide the right education and the direction for my children to succeed in the educational system. Training parents, I think you just said, it was an interesting idea, an interesting concept. What do families need to know when that first kid that's going to college is in college? They need to know many things, but one important part is financially, where are the resources to support the students? They also need to know the expectations in high school and not the expectations in college. Mm -hmm. You need to develop that independence of uh, work and they need to understand that going to college is actually important, maintaining that momentum. We have a lot of students who for many reasons need to come part-time and I usually tell them if you have to cut back at least take one course. It's really hard if you totally step out to come back. So maintain a little bit of that momentum, that's important. All of the faculty and the advisors and um, all of the personnel at the colleges are willing to help. Do not be afraid to ask questions. Do not be afraid to reach out. Do not be afraid to ask for mentors, for tutoring. Many times the parents don't know that. So a lot of the work we're doing is making sure that all of that information is readily available mm -hmm. in many forms, including Spanish, English, internet, and print because uh, we want to empower, the, well, the entire family and sure. the students That's too, exactly right. to actually get the right level of information. But when you've never gone to college, you may not even know what to ask. Indeed, <laughs> and you know, we talk about the families, expectations I'm sure are there. Is it, are, are they realistic expectations? Not, I mean, on both levels, maybe expecting too much from the kid, maybe not expecting enough, because again, there's a lack of experience there. I think what we understand from Latino families is that the concept of familism is very important. Correct. So this is a systemic, a network effort that's being put forward for the child to proceed through the education system. And so I think we need to do as much as we can to educate the family, as Maria said, through social service agencies, through churches, through public announcements on TV and help them to understand what is this college experience about, what can you do to help your child go through, and what's expected of them. And I think one of the things that we'd like to emphasize is that that dialogue about the importance of higher education start very early, yeah. but continue mm -hmm. on even in college. When parents may not realize what the experience for their child is gonna be, it's still important for them to maintain that level of conversation because the child may feel isolated being to college. in college, it's a new experience, they may feel even greater isolation if they don't have the opportunity to discuss what's happening with their family. And we those expectations that need to start early on in the early grades because one of the main factors for students not staying in college is if they come in with uh, inadequate academic preparation. Yes. So that strong foundation for mm -hmm. education should be in place from the moment the students are going to, uh, to school. So to me, making sure they understand that is important too. And to me the criticalness is that when we look at it, right, you know, some of the factoids, right? If you look at the kindergarten population in the state, 60 plus percent mm -hmm. Latinos. So five years old or so, another 13 years they're gonna be voting, they're gonna be in our workforce, mm -hmm. and they're the ones that are gonna be contributing to the social security system and other things. So it's important to our society in general that we're, that we're, no matter who it is, whether it's Latinos or any other race, that we need to be investing in education in our children in order for this state to compete at the national and global levels. So what do you tell policymakers? So consistent with <laughs> David's message, and I would tell policymakers as well as every person on the street, if we really are worried about our resources, our, our country's financial resources going to programs like welfare or other social services, 
The answer to that is really to create a workforce that is self-sustaining. And we can only do that if we invest in education from the outset and build the programs in that allow students, irrespective of race, ethnicity, gender, whatever dimension, uh, to succeed, to build on their successes. So I think it's important for us to understand that we're all in this together. Um, and so when we empower the children, whatever background they are, to succeed, it really is beneficial to the society as a whole. All right. Well, great conversation. Good to have you all here. Thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate thank, it. Thank, thank you very you. much. Tuesday on Arizona Horizon, we'll try to figure out what happened to this winter's forecast for above average El Nino rains. And it's the latest science news with renowned ASU physicist Lawrence Krauss. It's at 530 and 10 on the next Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Helios Education Foundation is proud to underwrite Arizona Education, a 12-month series highlighting the issues affecting college and career readiness of our students. Through a decade of strategic partnerships, Helios is working to change lives and strengthen communities through education.